आई वी एम वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी अ डेली पॉडकास्ट बाय द तक्षशिला इंस्टीट्यूशन we are a bunch of policy nerds based in bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hello and welcome to all things policy those who have been following international news closely might have heard the name alexei navalny uh, suddenly being thrown about a lot in the last couple of months navalny is an opposition politician from russia um, and very recently he was um, the victim of a fairly high profile attempted assassination which ended with him having to fly to germany for emergency medical care um, and ended with him actually going back to russia where he was where the assassination attempt against his life was made um, and where he is now in jail there have been multiple attempts to get him out of jail courts have rather insisted that he needs to stay in jail um he has issued calls to his supporters to come out and protest against the regime um and some pretty unprecedented things are happening it might not seem like a very big deal uh, but russian president vladimir putin for the very first time has actually come out and tried to um dismiss some of the claims that navalny has been making about putin's personal wealth in the past um now for dedicated russia watchers this is all probably going to be old news um but what we'd like to do in this particular podcast is really try to get into personality of alexey navalny who is he where is he coming from um and what is his relation to the overall russian political system how is it going to be evolving over the next few years um i have with me today aditya parikh welcome aditya hi anirudh it's great to be here so let's begin from the very beginning as it were aditya let's first try to understand who this man alexey navalny is um tell us a little bit about him tell us a little bit about his career as a russian opposition politician so uh navalny when you look at his uh, credentials he is a lawyer he is an activist he is a politician so he has become this uh, uh, darling of the west where uh, uh, he's uh, seen in the west as the face of the russian opposition there have been multiple incarcerations uh, inflicted upon him there have been raids on his anti corruption activist ngos and uh, the russian authorities have uh, uh, prosecuted him they've awarded him uh, suspended sentences so uh, in the west he has somehow emerged as a figure which is kind of comparable to what to alexander isaevich solzhenitsyn uh, used to be in the cold war era so uh, like the west championed him as this uh, face of the anti soviet uh, voice inside the soviet union so navalny without the literary talent is kind of comparable to him all right so um you mentioned multiple times that he has become a darling of the west um how was it exactly that navalny rose to a position where he started to get western media attention in the first place well the thing is actually navalny uh, rose to fame in an era where the internet uh, defines our lives so uh, when you look at the polls conducted by levada center which has a good reputation for uh, uh, conducting public opinion polls and uh, fairly uh, unbiased ones so and i make that assumption because you know uh, the russian establishment has actually uh, prosecuted them for being a foreign agent that they have received fundings from uh, the west specifically the us there has been a story about them being termed a foreign agent uh, from tas so yeah i would say that kind of establishes them as not very favorable to the regime currently in power in russia so there was this uh, public opinion poll which put navalny as uh, the darling of uh, inside russia a very small percentage of people like his approval rating in 2019 was just 9% and most of the people who were uh, approving of his activities as a anti corruption activist were mostly people uh, who got their news from the internet and most of the uh, older people in russia uh, which make up like 50% or so of the population who disapproved of him got their news from uh, normal tv channels and state media so basically it's a, a old versus new re, rebellious 
politically active children being uh, his main political base and uh, the establishment to counting on uh, the complacency of the masses who are indifferent to uh, the politics in the country so that's how it is that's interesting and i think that it kind of sets us up well for having like a a broader discussion on on the way that russian politics works uh, now you touched upon this kind of generational divide uh, in terms of the way that uh, russians are consuming political news um so i get the impression that people who are watching tv channels are are exposed to a much more pro government narrative right so uh, why exactly is that why is why is there this this divide in the media in terms of how the russian government is perceived well we like it or not the russian media sphere is mostly controlled by the government and there are only these alternative uh, uh, media establishment media verticals which are uh, uh, mostly new media so most of the uh, you know anti establishment voice that you'd find is only on the internet and it's a fringe honestly because you know uh, for better or worse the russian uh, the larger russian psyche has been up until now at least been that of political indifference so this is uh, just a societal characteristic that you can't really uh, see parallels of uh, anywhere else i mean if things are better uh, they're indifferent as long as you know th- this has a background to the 90s after the fall of the soviet union things got really bad uh, economy wise for uh, the russians so if things improved and uh, you know uh, i followed a lot of youtubers uh, who talk about their own country and do uh, a few of them for uh, a few russian youtubers i'd say they have this uh, consensus that 2014 was a split uh, where you could uh, say russia was a different place pre crimea 2014 and post crimea 2014 because uh, the entire country was taken in by this uh, uh, image of putin as the strong man and who's going to guarantee uh, russian territorial integrity and uh, russia's place in the world uh, and there was a lot of state push for this narrative that to uh, putin is the man who's for the past so many years he is taken you out of that destitution of the 90s so this image with uh, combine it with the political indifference which is kind of characteristic of uh, the entire nation's psyche as long as things go right so i mean it's a perfect storm and that's how it's been for the past uh, few decades okay so i mean i'm not sure to what extent uh, a nation has a psyche as such but um i i will say that it's 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 fair to say that um given the kind of economic turbulence and turmoil that russians have had to face um for generations um which is quite in contrast to the rest of the world where a growing economy has more or less been taken for granted right mm-hmm. um it does seem that their expectations of economic performance of government are apparently somewhat lower um but your the point you made about putin as protecting um national integrity is an interesting one uh, aditya i think um i think is worth actually getting into um this image of putin as a as a restorer of russia's great power status as little bit because as i understand it that's an image that is very often pushed by uh, russian state controlled media um mm-hmm. especially for example um r today which is like one one of the biggest news outlets in the world and is very well known for pushing a uh, pro putin rhetoric especially in english language channels mm-hmm. um one thing that putin has really been doing after crimea is trying to get russia involved in um, major international issues especially in the middle east uh, with the support of syria and so on um so can you give us a little more context about that how do um how do the how do average russian voters uh, perceive putin as a restorer of uh, the kind of great power status once held by the soviet union i think this uh, this is somewhat parallel to what noam chomsky would say that uh, when there's uh, internal strife the leader uh, whose legitimacy is being threatened uh would ra- rally the people around the flag uh, to protect his own legitimacy so 2014 when you look at crimea it is a very important strategic interest of uh, russia to uh, have that port uh, that warm water port so sevastopol became a very central thing to uh, russian identity uh, that uh, 
the Russian state media was pushing a narrative that, hey, this is the place where we've defeated the Nazis, where uh, the great patriotic wars, were one of the most important battles uh, were fought here. So this uh, uh, this great patriotic, uh, patriotic war narrative has been pushed since uh, Stalin's time. And uh, apart from the 90s, when everything in Russia was uh, uh, just not well, and the state had reduced capacity ever since and before that, the great patriotic war being the center of Russian identity is uh, something that's been prevalent. So here, that emotion, that uh, sense of identity was again invoked and the people responded to it because Russians uh, at heart are patriots and uh, that narrative just resonates with them because, you know, you, you st- just uh, see the kind of uh, sacrifices that were made in that war. So generations from that, uh, the echoes are still there. Again, that's an interesting point. I'm not sure I will agree that Russians are fundamentally X, Y, Z or whatever, considering that Russia, of course, is an extremely diverse country with a huge number of ethnicities spanning across many, many longitudes, right? The point about uh, the great patriotic war, as it were, um, being something that has profound resonance is, I think, a good one. And um, I think both of us have recently read this book called uh, Red Plenty, right? Which actually talks about uh, the optimism that the Soviet Union had in the 1950s and 60s about actually creating a communist industrialist model that would uh, lead to a European existence for all of its citizens. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really strikes me in all of the chapters of that book is how Russian leaders, especially Khrushchev, genuinely seem to believe in Russia's kind of um, manifest destiny, as it were, Mm -hmm. that was shaped by the trauma of uh, the Second World War and would emerge into a plenty shape by uh, massive industrialization, uh, Mm. which, of course, sitting in in a post-USSR world, um, Mm. we know very well didn't actually end up happening. Um, Mm. But all right, so so let's come back to uh, the present day and talk a little more about uh, Putin and Navalny. Now, at the very beginning of this conversation, you mentioned that a lot of um, Navalny's anti-corruption NGOs have faced repeated raids from the Russian state. Um, And now, it seems to to me that the only that the reason why all these raids are happening is because claims that the Russian state is corrupt do have some kind of political traction, um, especially with perhaps uh, younger voters who are somewhat more optimistic about the kind of role that politicians should play in the economy. So what kind of claims has Navalny been making um, and how precisely do they impact Putin's political position, especially given that, as we've discussed over the last few minutes, um, he's done such a good job of kind of portraying himself as as a restorer of the glories uh, of the Soviet Union. Well, uh, corruption is something that has been a part of Russian politics uh, since the very inception. So if we take the modern era, in the 90s, there was a lot of graft. And in the wake of uh, people realizing, hey, the Soviet empire is going to fall, a lot of people who were in uh, state positions at the time, uh, they had the power of influence over state funds. A lot of things were, they just disappeared. Nobody has been able to track down what happened to uh, certain important state assets which made the foundation of uh, the Russian economy. So everything was built from scratch in the 90s. Uh, I think that that is kind of a, a accepted maxim after the fall of the Soviet Union. So graft is something that you can't take out of uh, the Russian politics. So the best thing that the national uh, Russian psyche hopes for is that uh, individual freedoms and uh, individual indifference are kind of correlated. So as long as uh, you are allowed to go by your everyday life, you don't really have to worry about a lot of things uh, on the higher echelons of power. So uh, from what I see, Putin has been accused of a lot of things, but the thing is, there's always a cost to benefit analysis going on in a normal Russian's head that, hey, we've seen the apparatchiks from the Soviet Communist Party and we've seen Putin and his cronies and we've seen Yeltsin and his circle. So if you look at it from an objective uh, timeline, you would see that uh, the amount of graft and the uh, blatant to, uh, I don't know, disregard for uh, individual liberty has been, uh, you know, going down. It's a downward trajectory for uh, uh, craft and uh, oppression. But is it 
to the same standard as the West or the free world as we like to call it? No, it isn't because they're two very different political systems. I mean, it's a very similar argument to how you'd perceive the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China today. Uh, they've had to economic prosperity, but to individual freedom isn't exactly uh, to the same level as the rest of the world, the free world. So uh, Russia is in a far better place uh, compared to uh, the People's Republic of China today. So what was the specific thing that Navalny has most recently said uh, that seems to have like kind of uh, triggered this entire storm that's broken out? It was something to do with uh, Putin's supposed mansions um, somewhere along the Black Sea coast, correct? Yeah, but that didn't really start the storm. If you uh, take his poisoning and uh, his raid on his NGOs, it wasn't really about this film uh, in which Navalny shows off this huge mansion which allegedly belongs to Putin. We don't have proof that it actually belongs to Putin, as far as I know. I mean, So uh, the thing is, Putin has uh, on camera denied that uh, it is... Uh, anything that he owns or anyone he knows owns and uh, none of his relatives own that uh, none nobody in his internal circle know, uh, owns that so the thing is uh, navalny has been prosecuted before navalny uh, has been an enemy of the russian state in the eyes of the current regime uh, for quite a long time so he has previously targeted fsb uh, Officials, he has targeted uh, sitting uh, ministers of the Russian Federation. He's targeted regional governors and he's obviously targeted the United Russia Party, uh, which is Putin's party, calling them thugs and thieves, I think. Uh, that would be the rough translation. So he, he made that a nickname in his, uh, his, his campaigning when he was uh, trying to contest the elections, but he was banned by the regime uh, to appear on the ballot. And he was incarcerated at that time. Interesting. So, where, where do you see Navalny really going in the long term, Parikh? I mean, um, last Thursday, we had this discussion in the office um, where he talked about what kind of actual numbers are there supporting him. Um, and then they were hardly awe-inspiring, to say the least. Um, so, where do you think that this game between Putin and Navalny is going in the long term? Um, do you see potential for um, Navalny taking power by democratic means? Or is it something that uh, Putin and his inner circle and his eventual successors uh, will want to prevent at all in any cost. See, uh, Navalny is a rank and file politician, if you would do, uh, allow me that expression. So he's the kind of person who is playing a long game. He's 44 years old currently and he realizes that realistically, uh, he's not going to say this outright, but he realizes that to, uh, he doesn't hold a chance until uh, Putin uh, is either dead or out of the picture. So he's not going to lead the Russian state. A new democratic regime is not going to be ushered into place uh, just like that. So after Putin, his plans are after Putin. So you see uh, his activism today is uh, uh, him trying to establish himself as an alternative after Putin is out of the picture. So uh, Navalny being jailed today, he might be sentenced for uh, three and a half years, four years. Uh, but he's just going along with the rules of the games. I mean, it's an occupational hazard for an activist in an uh, oppressive society, in an oppressive political system. To go through these things. All right. So before we wrap up, I think that it's important to remind all of our listeners that uh, Navalny himself is not, of course, um, some, some agent of like absolute transformation in the Russian political system. Um, as, as far as we've seen, he does have some views um, which would hardly be considered progressive by uh, Western points of view, even though the West hasn't really been talking about that very much. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the accusations that Navalny is actually a Russian ethno-nationalist, Aditya? Yeah, I mean, I've observed this, that uh, there's definitely a strain of people on social media that uh, like to bring up his past statements, prejudicial statements uh, with a ethno-nationalist uh, kind of Russian supremacist kind of uh, ideology where he's made uh, these statements against, I mean, I remember he made the statement on TV uh, against Uzbeks uh, that uh, nobody in Uzbekistan knows who Pushkin is. And this was followed by 
a huge storm on uh, Uzbekistan's social media where people were reciting verses from Pushkin uh, that, hey, I parked my donkey there, but hey, I can recite Pushkin because I was also part of the same uh, uh, Russian state at one point uh, as your people were. So, I mean, this uh, prejudicial comment was kind of in bad taste. So you'd find a bunch of things where Navalny has said worse or uh, even something not very appropriate for me to repeat on this podcast. So this was one of the tamer ones. So there is definitely a lot of material available if you want to look into the kind of views that Navalny has. And uh, I would say he's just another politician who's looking to be an alternative after Putin is out of the picture. So we shouldn't think that he's some sort of an angel. He's the darling of the West because uh, he's just in the news. Hmm. All right, fair point. So I'm sure that there's going to be a lot more news about Navalny and um, and the powers that be in the Russian state apparatus in the years to come. So what are your recommendations for how our listeners could potentially follow them? Are there any resources or publications that you find particularly useful uh, when trying to piece together what's happening in Russian politics? Yeah, definitely. So uh, for English language resources, you should follow... Uh, uh, a few Russia watches. So, for example, uh, you can follow uh, Mark Chaliathi and uh, you can follow uh, Mr. Brian Whitmore. Uh, he has a podcast called uh, Power Vertical, uh, which I've been a listener of for a long time. So I highly recommend it. So they obviously uh, look at a lot of negative things about uh, Russian politics and uh, where things are oppressive and etc. But those are fundamentals of Kremlin watching because you don't look at the Kremlin uh, for good news uh, in the West. So uh, listen to what they have against the Russian state because honestly, TASS does a very good job of bringing out the positives of the Russian state and where things are going right. So if you want to uh, have a balanced view of Russia, if you want to watch Russia uh, and you want to watch the Kremlin, so start with TASS. Get all the good news and compare that with uh, Brian Whitmore's podcast uh, with Mark Eliade's uh, blog. Uh, it's called In Moscow's Shadow. Uh, I guess we'll uh, link all of them in the description. Uh, so if you want to have this balanced view of Russian politics, you should consider both sides. What the West puts out, what uh, Kremlin watches in the West put out and what the Russian state puts out. So that would give you a balanced view. As for uh, internally, uh, what liberals in Russia write, that would be Medusa.io, I think, and uh, uh, Tatiana Stanovaya. And uh, she runs, uh, she's a, I think, uh, non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Moscow Center. And she also runs this uh, a media vertical called Our Politik. I'd also like to mention that some of these people that I've mentioned uh, who are uh, Russia watchers, I keep in high regard. So uh, I've seen this consensus amongst them that to Putin, because uh, since after the new provisions in the Russian uh, constitution, he can now rule up to 2036, where he will be 84. So uh, at his age, a person can't really keep up with the everyday administration of uh, such a large and powerful uh, entity as the Russian Federation. So this has been a rumor that his health is also not what it used to be. So there has been this uh, assertion by many Kremlin watchers that he's going to delegate his authority uh, for everyday tasks to uh, his inner circle gradually going forward. But he would retain the absolute veto on uh, uh, Russia's position in the world, on its uh, foreign affairs, uh, on its military affairs. Uh, so uh, military procurement and military positioning, that sort of a thing, uh, he would keep a close eye on. He'd have his fingers in that part. So people have crudely called this a role quite like uh, what uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan who is also very close to Putin, uh, has so in his own country. So Putin is going to be uh, crudely put a grandfather to Russia's National Security Council. That's the role he envisions for himself going forward. So there is no plan for succession, but there's been a lot of rumors. So this is one thing that has been, you know, uh, consistent uh, as far as consensus is go. 
That's interesting. All right. So thank you for that interesting overview of the politics of Russia today, Aditya. And um, um, I, I once again, I'd once again recommend to all of our listeners to check out the resources that were going to be in the description. Um, and you can expect that there are going to be um, more episodes and all things policy today tracking uh, the situation in Russia as it unfolds. Um, on that note, um, thank you so much for joining us, Aditya. And thank you all for listening to All Things Policy. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST or our website, takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. We're IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Storytel and The Whole Truth Foods. Thank you for supporting us. So, great week on the network again this week. Definitely do check out the Prakriti Podcast. Pavan spoke to Krishna Shok. They discussed science, knowledge, and the wonder of Indian home cooking. Staying in the realm of food, on this round is on me. We had AD Singh as a guest. Gauri and AD discussed the 10 years anniversary of the table and like the 20 year anniversary of Olive. So two of Bombay's biggest restauranteurs have a conversation about the restaurant business. All Things Policy celebrated 500 episodes on January 27th. Manoj talks to Aditya and Anirudh about the surprising origins of the podcast, its evolution over the last few years, and its exciting future. This episode also marks the video debut, so definitely do check that out on YouTube. On Storytellers and Storytellers, Vineet talks to Ranjit Pratap Singh. Ranjit is the co-founder and CEO of Pratilipi. Pratilipi is a company that's recently acquired IVM. And Ranjit on this episode discusses his plans to build a homegrown media empire, his love for comics, and how India can have its own comic cinematic universe. And finally, Cyrus had an exciting week. We had some amazing guests this week. We had Vishal Gundal come and talk about Fauji. We had Atish Tathir talk about the various issues that he had been facing with his OCI card and other things like that. We had Adam Dow talk about things going on in the US and like, you know, the evolution of what's happening there. We had Siddharth Kanan come and talk about his history with Cyrus and his new show. So definitely do come check that out as well. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. Hey, I'm Zarina, your peak performance coach, leadership coach, and life coach. And I'm here to unleash that power within you with your weekly dose of mantras and empowerment. Tune in to Monday Mantras every Monday for your quick fix and the empowering series with Zarina Punawala every Thursday for riveting real life stories. You can catch us on the IBM podcast website, app, or wherever you get your podcast from.